Chairman, and, and uh, again, I join with everybody else, Mr. Horowitz, for thanking you and your team for the work that you have done here. Uh, I'm going to go back to an issue that's been talked about by many of my colleagues today, and that is this question of bias. Uh, and actually, I want to start by going back to June of 2018, uh, when you were last here before the committee. Mm -hmm. And when I asked questions of you at that time, I had talked about your findings then with regard yep. to bias. Uh, the specific focus that I recall there was uh, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and the information that's already been well presented here about the, what I consider to be the undeniable bias that they had against the President, President Trump. Uh, at that time, you made similar statements to those you made today, which is that you did not find bias in the decisions that you were evaluating in that mm -hmm. report. <clears throat> but as I went through that with you, I think that you also confirmed that you were not saying that there was no bias by those who were involved in making decisions. Other, rather, you were saying you could not prove that that bias was a factor in their management of the activities they engaged in on behalf of the FBI. Um, as I understood it, uh, you said that there was bias, but in fact that you had asked them whether their bias influenced their work performance. They had told you that it did not and you had no contrary evidence to dispute that. Is that correct? Um, let me clarify. I, let me explain. I, we found that those text messages evidence bias. And what we ultimately found was that other people were involved and made many of those decisions, not them. And that was the base, not because we didn't know whether they were biased. Those texts evidenced bias by them. All right. I the think question was the other individuals who we didn't have text messages for, otherwise in the evidence of, of bias by those individuals. And that would be consistent with what your report here today says. Uh, as I'm reading from the executive summary, uh, Deputy Attorney General, I, th I believe that's his title, Priestap. Uh, yeah, uh, Assistant Director or Deputy Assistant, Assistant Director. Director, depending upon okay. the time period. Uh, he's the one who made the final decision to open to each open. of the four investigations. Correct. He did that in consultation with uh, a number of others, including Peter Strzok. Correct. And uh, you don't necessarily know what advice was given in those conversations, do you? I, I don't. But he made the final decision, and because you had no, as, and you've used the phrase very con consistently here today, you did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that political bias or improper motivation influenced the decision to open these four investigations. Right. Did you ask Mr. Priestap whether he had bias? We, we asked all the witnesses, not just him, as to whether, as to whether bias or other improper considerations um, had any impact. But we also looked for emails, text messages, documents, that could show what we found, frankly, was struck in page. I mean, if th that is how you find evidence of bias. Oh, bias. Now, beyond that, I'm stuck trying to understand what's in somebody's head if there's no other. I just want to make it really clear what it is you are saying and Correct. what you are not saying. Correct. And uh, in this case, what you're saying is that you could not find any documentary, documentary or testimonial evidence to con contradict the statements of the investigators that they were not letting bias influence their decision. Correct. Do you believe that's an open question? Um, I mean, you, I, I can only I can only speak to the evidence we found. I, I think the important point here, and I, and I made earlier, is all the evidence is here. People are free to consider, evaluate what they think ultimately people's motivations were. Um, we don't reach a you can't, definitive. You conclusion. you aren't making that decision. I, I, we're not making a decision on ultimately um, information, evidence we don't have um, it, that, that somebody acted, may have acted. <clears throat> but there's, a, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of uh, most of us who have, on, on this side of the aisle at least, who have talked to you today, I think there's tons of evidence of bias here. In fact, you have referred for further action to the Attorney General uh, one case for criminal prosecution, if I understand it right, and other cases of how many other individuals? So, I, but I want to be clear, we're talking now about the FISA as opposed to the opening. I understand, and there is a distinction There's between a the opening of the investigation very significant distinction and the conduct of the investigation. Correct. 
And so I'm moving. I understand that. In That's, fact, I appreciate I've tried to making separate that those clarification. Two. Because in the conduct of the investigation, it appears to me there has been intense bias. But you're not making that judgment. I understand that. You're referring that to the Attorney General, correct? Mm -hmm. And the FBI for adjudication, and consideration the FBI, of this. And understood. And I How believe in response to Senator Ernst's question on this same issue, you indicated that similarly, since you could not find any documentary evidence or testimonial evidence to contradict their statements that they were not biased, that that leaves an open question as to what the FBI or the Attorney General will find with these referrals. There are significant serious failures here on the operation of the, particularly in connection with the FISAs, whether it was sheer gross incompetence um, uh, that led to this versus intentional misconduct and what the motivate and any or anything in between and what the motivations are I can't tell you you're as not I sit making here today. that decision I can't tell you as I sit here today because I don't have enough evidence to reach a conclusion but if someone were to characterize what you are telling us to be that you're telling us there is no bias here that's not what you're telling us that is not as to the operation of these FIs is what I'm telling you all right understood and uh, I, I did want to get to this question, though, about the operation of uh, the, the FISAs. Uh, and again, you may not answer this, and that's fine. But it seems to me that if, you, if we go beyond the bias question to intentional versus grossly negligent, it seems to me that the kind of misconduct that has been presented by you and reviewed by our chairman and many others here today is mind-numbing to consider that it could be just accidental. Can you reach a conclusion like that? Uh, I'd be skeptical, but I understand why people would be skeptical of that. Uh, I, I, there is such a range of conduct here that is inexplicable, and the answers we got were not satisfactory, that we're left trying to understand how could all these errors have occurred over a nine-month period or so among three teams handpicked High, one of the highest profile, if not the highest profile case in the FBI, going to the very top of the organization involving a presidential campaign. Well, I, and I understand that. I appreciate that. I think it is explicable. Uh, but I understand that you can't, or at least aren't, yeah. going to make that jump. You are going to refer these cases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I appreciate that. I, is criminal prosecution a possible action in the cases other than the one you've specifically referred? I'd, I, I wouldn't want to prejudice or prejudge anything. I, I'd leave it to the department to speak to you on that. All right. Uh, let me go on for just a moment. When, when, the, when uh, let me, let's move to the whistleblower question just mm -hmm. once more. I, I'm shifting topics completely. It's come up several times today, and I understand your point that a whistleblower is entitled to anonymity. Mm -hmm. uh, explain to me how it happens that the person accused when a whistleblower makes an accusation can have the right that most Americans think they should have to confront those testifying against them. How, does, how is that accomplished? So I'll speak to what we do. We get anonymous allegations uh, um, frequently. We get people coming forward who are reporting misconduct, who want to be anonymous, who want to stay anonymous. So we get them both ways. We get people walking in saying, keep me anonymous, and anonymous complaints. We move forward on both if we think they're sufficient to move forward on and predicated and have support. Um, but we then have to prove the allegations and get corroboration for it, because you're right. The individual, if there is a finding of misconduct, has a right to ultimately challenge the evidence found. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they get all the way back to where the, the nugget started if that information is corroborated through other means. And the, the IG Act requires us, actually. The congressional, the law says, and um, uh, Senator Grassley obviously has had a role in this, uh, makes it quite clear. We are not, unless we're legally obligated to provide the information, the law requires us to do so. It's our obligation as IGs to keep that information. Well, I appreciate not. that because, as you know, we may face that question here in the Senate yeah. relatively yeah. quickly. Last quick question, and, and I'm running out of time, so I just would like a quick yeah. answer if you could. I'm trying to find out 
who brought the steel dossier to the attention of the FBI for the investigation? Was that Andrew McCabe or was that Bruce Orr? So it was Steele in July 5th of 2016 going to his handling agent. The agent, there's a dispute whether he was a confidential source or not. We spend a number of pages on this. But the agent that Steele had a relationship with is the agent he went to with some of his reports. That agent then took, it, put it through a process at the FBI, and it then took from July 5th to September 19th to get the information to the Crossfire Hurricane team. Eventually, in that meandering over the, to what is that, two and a half months, uh, there is information that we conclude in here that Mr. McCabe was involved in referring it over to the Crossfire Hurricane team. All right, thank you.